I returned last week after a 14-hour drive from the good Christian colony of Massachusetts Bay and the premiere of Attenshay's newest film, The Sudbury Devil. And while this review started off as a simple community tab post, I found that my inane ramblings were long enough to justify a quick video. Shocking enough, I know. Uh, I had the pleasure to attend the film with two good friends of mine, Chris the Redcoat and the Far Off Station, the former of whom is both far more qualified to speak on the merits of a film than myself, uh, and he has already posted a more brief review for if you'd like to get a good sense of whether you should watch the film or not while still being able to go in blind, which is generally how I prefer to watch movies myself. But Oh, if you would like to hear a pedantic prude waffling on about a film filled to the brim with sex and violence, and sexual violence, well then carry on. Just uh, do keep in mind as well that I count the film's creator as a friend, so, you know, bias and all that. I wouldn't be making this video if I didn't have good things to say, so keep that in mind. Uh, so the very first thing that struck me and which uh, carried on even actually got stronger throughout the film uh, was that save for very occasional brief moments, it really did feel utterly and completely professional to me. I mean to say that, you know, when one walks into a low-budget YouTuber-made movie, then you're probably going to have certain usually negative expectations of what that entails. That surely there's gonna be moments of, you know, amateurish acting. Maybe it's good on the whole, but you know, here and there, it's gonna be moments that you kinda have to look past. There might be some, you know, rather poor special effects. Maybe there's gonna be bits where the writing just doesn't hit quite all that hard. But the thing is, is that I didn't feel that way at all during this film. Rather, throughout the entire experience, I was blown away at just how big budget it all felt while still maintaining the spirit and, and definitely the fringe style of an independent film. A big part of that was the spectacular acting. One monologue in particular, which is um, speaking to the horrors of early American uh, frontier-style warfare, the monologue, it was, it was genuinely beautiful, and, and it was terrifying as well. It was very, very well written and expertly performed. Um, if you've ever seen, Pop, I'm trying to do a script. You can't be making noises like that. It's got to be dramatic. Okay, Pop. If you've ever seen the movie Snowpiercer, by, kind of a left turn there, I know, but uh, there's a monologue in that film. Uh, it's often known as the I Know What People Taste Like uh, monologue. It has that kind of vibe to it. It's, it's disturbing and it's intimate and it's, and it's really, it's just gross. Uh, now note, this movie is not a war film. It's not about, uh, like literally speaking, King Philip's War, but the shadow of that war looms heavily over the entire production and, and particularly that one character as his previous wartime experiences are heavily informing um, both who he is and, of course, the decisions that he makes. So it's like not—it's not a film like literally about the war, but it's—it's it's about the war, if you know what I mean. Uh, the soundtrack as well—it it felt like it, it must have been pulled from a big budget movie because it was so good. But but it wasn't. It was custom made for this film. It was able to evoke an incredibly wide variety of themes and cultures and emotions and actually I found myself listening to it uh, a fair amount when doing some creative writing of my own. Uh, it's one of those soundtracks that, uh, despite obviously it's not actually coming from the time period itself, but it manages to, again, evoke a certain sense of what was happening during the time period really, really well. Uh, the film also does utilize some period music like uh, drinking songs and such in a way that helps to add to that historical flair. Um, and if you enjoy that sort of, you know, social culture of the 17th century, particularly 17th century, like, puritanical America, um, then I think that there's uh, going to be a lot here that you'll enjoy. Uh, which brings me, I think, to one of the movie's biggest features, the language, the period-appropriate terminology and the accents 
It's all wonderful to hear on a big screen. Mr. Fletcher, this is Isaac Goodenough. Oh, God give you good mouth, sirs. Welcome to my home. Uh, now, to my knowledge, the only other movie that really approaches that subject is The Witch, uh, which obviously has a, a lot of thematic similarities to this production, but I'll come to that one later. Uh, one of my biggest pet peeves is uh, when, when I'm watching a historical film and everyone is speaking in such obviously modern language, especially in the swears and the insults, it just kind of gets cringy after a while, doesn't it? Not to overuse that word, but it, it just doesn't feel right. It takes you out of the time period as you hear these modern individuals speaking modern fashions, it just in a bit of an old-timey looking environment. Uh, and not only uh, is, is it really good there from the writing perspective, but, but from the acting itself, uh, the language worked really well. You know, it, it, you might expect the actors to like sort of stumble over some lines because of the difficulties of getting into that accent, but it wasn't really the case. They enunciated very well, and overall, I think it actually really helped the characterization. It helped the film uh, rather than acting as a hindrance to their ability to you know, get the lines out to get into their characters. I think it helped them rather than hurt them. Uh, here and there, now, uh, when there's like a lot of shouting going on, well, I think that subtitles would definitely um, would have helped. Uh, but even then, uh, even if I couldn't make out uh, a word here or there, it wasn't really a big issue. You could still tell what's going on. Uh, now, on a somewhat similar note, it's also important to point out uh, that obviously this is a 17th century, it's set in that, time period film. Uh, certain racial, certain gendered terminology uh, was used in this historical environment with a very different moral understanding than, uh, than what we have of those words today. Uh, and the film didn't shy away from using those words, from using that language, speaking in that way, uh, when it was thematically appropriate. You know, unlike certain other films, uh, they didn't use uh, what we would today understand as racist terminology as an opportunity to, you know, morally grandstand to the audience and say, oh, look how good this one character is, as opposed to, they didn't do that. They, they, they treated it on its own terms, if that makes sense. They had the characters speaking with and to each other as they would have spoken in the context within which they were placed. Uh, and then they left the interpretation of that language up to the audience, rather than just telling you what to think, uh, which I think it's, it's a very simple, yet it's a vital sign of maturity on the part of the script. Now, uh, that idea of interpretation and maturity in the face of difficult circumstances brings us to the film's story. And um, as you may have already heard, it was weird. It, like, it was, it was really weird. Uh, and I would say I'd say that mostly in a good way, um, and exactly the kind of product that you'd expect from someone like Aton Shea. Uh, well, may maybe, maybe weirder than that. Uh, like Chris said in his review, if you only know Aton Shea as the funny internet history man, oh, I've seen an episode or two of Checkmate Lincolnites, uh, maybe do a little bit of research into the film before you go to see it, because otherwise um, you might be in for an unpleasant surprise, a bit of a shock. Um, in, in those terms, the film's plot relies very heavily on themes of sexuality and of violence, in, including, yes, the combination thereof. Uh, actual nudity is, with one or two noteworthy exceptions, actually kind of limited by modern standards, um, but there are certain uh, explicit scenes which may leave some viewers uncomfortable. Uh, without going into spoiler territory, if you're uncomfortable with themes of sexual assault in particular, uh, or even just very explicit sexual imagery, then do not watch this film. If you, if you are a minor, do not watch this film. But I'm glad to say that even if I personally, with my Anglican-style sensibilities, uh, I, I definitely would have pulled back a few of those scenes. Um, ultimately, most of it still felt appropriate to the film's aims. Uh, most of the visceral elements weren't just there to gross you out. 
they were there to serve a purpose, uh, to, to demonstrate some deeper and deep, deeper, d deeply disturbed element of psychology or, you know, whatever have you, um, to the audience. I often joke, you know, that like HBO's own obsession with poorly written sexuality, it often feels like an HBO scriptwriter is a 14 year old who only just realized that, oh my God, you mean if I write into the script and then she takes her top off, that the actress will actually do it? Ha <laughs> you know. That's not what we're dealing with here. Um, to, God, to say nothing of how uh, cleanly HBO seems to think that things like a human head might be lopped off. Uh, again, it's generally not the case here though. Uh, one or two exceptions, depending on how you look at it. Uh, but again, even if I personally would have maybe, you know, maybe shortened a few scenes, maybe hidden some stuff, for the most part, that, that's not really on my part a matter of moral outrage, uh, it's just a personal preference. Uh, Andy very clearly has a very distinct vision for this film and how he could use shock value to achieve that vision rather than just, you know, splattering gore and, and, and rude scenes uh, in front of you to, to get a rise out of the audience. Um, so I, I really, because of that, I don't think that I can get all too upset with him. Um, one particular shot made me definitely, definitely raise an eyebrow. You'll know it when you see it, but you know, ultimately there's a function behind it. Uh, but in any case, we'll step away from that now and we'll come to another uh, elephant or, or perhaps I should say another billy goat in the room. The Sudbury Devil is a film about witchcraft and devilry on the American frontier during the 17th century. Featuring period-appropriate accents, it deals with themes of trauma and isolation, religious and community pressures, and of course sexuality within highly restrictive social environments. Does that sound familiar to you at all? It is inevitable that this film will be compared with the 2015 film, The Witch, because of these similarities. One may even say, they might say, that the Sudbury Devil is standing in the witch's shadow. But I have to say that despite those similarities, I believe that both of these films very cleanly stand independent of one another. Sudbury is distinctive, and it definitely feels like its own project. It isn't copying much of anything or, or taking from the witch. A and to be sure, while the witch may be more effective in certain regards, I believe that Sudbury is confidently able to carve out its own space and, and speak to other concerns, particularly the, again, more sexual and political elements, far more powerfully than the witch does. If you enjoyed the one, then there's a good chance that you'll enjoy the other. But Sudbury Devil is no more copying the witch than Star Wars is copying Star Trek. Now, I mentioned themes. The story is, by the creator's own words, a very political one. And it's in that deeper interpretation that I think things get really interesting here. Because while you could definitely see the film as just a, oh, it's a spoop -em in the woods, such an interpretation would be missing the point by a pretty wide margin, and kind of obviously so, I think. Now, when it comes to politics, I don't want to go into details on Andy's intentions. Uh, there's no use in my repeating what he's already said to a uh, lesser quality, filtering it through my views, which would just muddy the waters. Uh, now, obviously, if, if you're familiar with Atonche's work, then you probably have a, a decent idea about his politics, and I imagine that you either love them or you hate them. For my part, I'd say that on most topics, Andy and I are either in complete agreement or we are diametrically opposed to one another. Um, although, of course, I, I can never admit to his face whenever we happen to agree. Um, and, and even when we do agree, it, we're probably coming at the issues from very different angles, very different worldviews and such. Uh, so if you'd like to hear uh, some of Atonche's own words on what the movie's all about, uh, you know, its core themes and all that, well then I'll link a video down below where a longtime friend of this channel, uh, DMMan33, uh, interviewed the man himself after that first night's showing. Uh, but again, I don't want to get into uh, into all of it too much because I don't want to color your own viewing. 
Uh, but discussing the film with people after the fact and, and listening to the actors and the producer and all those people um, afterwards during the post-showing Q&A, I was really intrigued to see just how many different impressions and different takeaways people could um, get out of, out, of the, out of the piece. Uh, how some people, you know, watched the film and came away with an entirely different narrative, uh, you know, about like certain social issues and the like that was completely different from my own. You know, as someone who's like not involved in the one debate, I, I missed a potential narrative entirely and walked away with something that was more related to my own interests and my own concerns and all that. Uh, and, and how at least one of the potential messages that, that I took away from the film was seemingly at odds with the impressions of pretty much everyone else in the crowd. Although when I pointed out to John afterwards, he's kind of like, oh yeah, I guess I could see that. A... Now, now admittedly, uh, most of that crowd that, that night that I was there, um, they're of a very distinctive persuasion, a very different people from myself. Uh, not in a bad way, just very, very different. Uh, after all, the premiere was shown at the Satanic Temple in Salem, of which, while I am not a Christian myself, uh, I'm not exactly a fan of the, um, of the vibe that they've got going, you know? Uh, but, but all the same, how some people could walk away with, with one kind of social concern in their mind, while others, different ones entirely, and how some people saw the film, again, more of the uh, regulars at the Satanic Temple, they saw it as like this anti-authoritarian, even, you know, a piece with a kind of like a vaguely hail Satan-y kind of vibes. Then I'm walking away with like the exact opposite, almost like uh, even potentially a pro-Christian message. Like that. I think that's really interesting. Um, and as much as I would like love actually to get into a real rant about, you know, the nitty gritty of, what I mean by how I took away like a pro-Christian message versus the main interpretation that most other people took. I, I want to get into it, but I promised Andy that I wasn't going to spoil the film and doing so would require massive spoilers. So um, I'm going to leave it nice and vague there. Uh, I even worry that I may have already said too much. But, uh, you know, maybe after a while the film being released to the uh, general public, I think they're looking at streaming services. So maybe when that happens, uh, maybe then I can finally talk about it a bit more. So at the end of the day, what did I think of the film? I, I definitely enjoyed it. I liked it. I absolutely love, I'm fascinated by how the horror genre, when it's done well, big asterisk there, when it's done well, it can so effectively explore these massive themes through such seemingly limited scopes. I, I think that the Sudbury Devil has a lot to say. And even if I don't necessarily agree with all that it is saying, I'm confident that it's going to provoke a lot of really interesting conversations, which ultimately, I have a feeling, is the goal. From a technical perspective, the acting, the writing, the sound design, the cinematography, they are all beautiful, exceedingly well done, beyond, uh, I think, the reasonable expectations of, again, a low-budget horror film shot in the woods. The material culture felt authentic. The editing and the special effects rarely, if ever, uh, bit off more than they could chew. And ultimately, I think, if you're able to stomach that little bit of gore and an unhealthy, maybe, amount of sexual imagery, uh, I do think it's a film worth checking out. Just like maybe do some research. If anything that I said here kind of like gives you pause, do some research into the, research into the film first, then dive in. Uh, and of course, until the next time, my dear viewer, I am, and I shall remain, your most humble and obedient of servants. Okay. Okay, I, I think he, he should be gone now. I don't think he's watching anymore, at least. Okay, listen up. Now that the fluff piece is out of the way, it's time for the real review. Time to talk about what actually matters. You see that? Oh, yeah. Yeah, that, my friends, is a short land pattern musket, the sort of which was not even produced, let alone in common use, until the mid-18th century. Maybe if Aton Shea actually cared, he'd stop spending so much time writing fan fiction about us. It ain't gonna happen, Andy. Or maybe he would have found a proper matchlock instead to actually use for the production. 
horribly inaccurate. There's too much water, zero out of 10.